we are pleasure for me to introduce the first uh, webinar on sustainable tourism of the year. And this pleasure is even bigger when the invited speaker is the renowned uh, marketing professor, um, Xavier Fon from the University of Surrey. This uh, webinar, Four Benefits of Better Sustainability Marketing and Communication, follows a successful webinar that we organized last October on um, reducing tourism seasonality through innovative, sustainable uh, experience. If you did not have the chance uh, to watch it, I recommend, I recommend you to do so. You can find all the material, uh, the recording and the presentation in our website. Um, so that, during that webinar, uh, we question ourselves at some point uh, how we should uh, describe, best describe our business uh, with regards to sustainability. Xavier Font uh, confessed he was put off with the, the use of certain words like, like sustainable. Of course, uh, we can all agree that um, the, these kind of words have been so much used that they don't have uh, any meaning uh, anymore. So I'm really, really grateful uh, to Xavier that uh, he has uh, uh, agreed to, to share his knowledge again and uh, to deepen in, in, in this uh, matter. So for those who do not uh, ask uh, yet, just to say that the Europe Park Federation is the largest and oldest in fact, we are celebrating 50 years uh, this year, uh, association or network of protected areas. So our main goal is to give support to, to the managers, and we do so um, by uh, promoting uh, networking and exchange through uh, the organization of conference, uh, workshops, webinars, uh, as uh, this one, and also by the promotion of specific programs, uh, with, uh, for example, the European Charter of uh, Sustainable Tourism in Protected Areas, which is one of the most successful one, has been already running for 20 years. So my name is Teresa Pastor, and I'm responsible for this program at the European level. This um, program um, offers a practical management tool to protected areas so that they become sustainable destinations. And it also um, applicate, uh, applies to um, to this business and to operators that uh, operate in, in that area. I hope this webinar is going to be useful for, for, for all of them. Just have an announcement. So uh, within uh, this program, we organize every two years a uh, network meeting. This year uh, is going to, uh, to take place in, in Triglav in Slovenia. Uh, we will uh, put in, in the chat a uh, direct link uh, so that you can uh, have more information. It's going to take place in May, and I hope uh, you will be interested in coming. Mm -hmm. The focus will be on uh, visitor uh, monitoring, which is a, a, key, a key issue in, in many protected areas at this moment. So just, just before starting, I would, would like to remind three basic rules of, uh, for the correct development of the webinar. So this webinar is recorded. If you are not uh, easy with that, just please uh, switch off your cameras. We would like you to write your name and your institution in, in the name box so that we know better you. And just use the chat uh, for your writing any comments, uh, any questions uh, that um, you may have. We will do our best to, uh, to handle them. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Xavier Fond has another commitment. So we will need to finish the webinar very short. Uh, will only last one hour, uh, so please be concise. Please, uh, I pass the floor now to, to Xavier Font. Uh, thanks, Teresa, and it's a pleasure to be back. And actually, it's, it's good to see the names of people where they come from. You know, some of the parks I've been to uh, already. Some uh, people who are already I am familiar with their work, um, as well. So, so it's just great to see the variety of places. You know, from from Spain to Norway, from. Romania to the UK, we've got a good representation of, uh, of parks across across Europe. Um, let me just share my screen and take you through um, some of the ideas that we've got today. But essentially, this follows from the, the conversation that we had um, a few months ago, like Teresa was saying, where I specifically talked about how to use um, um, the design of sustainable experiences to reduce seasonality. And there were a lot of comments during that day that was basically saying, yeah, but wait, what, what else? Right? There's, a, there's a lot more that we can do in how we market and communicate. And 
you are you're jumping to one particular you know benefit that we could have what other benefits have we got so i, I spoke with the team at europark and i decided to um, look at the presentation today we first called it the four benefits of marketing or better marketing communication but then last night I got carried away and added more benefits. Okay, so I've now retitled is no longer four benefits, guys. We've got more than four benefits today. But let me just take a step back first of all. Look, good news. Everybody, whenever we survey people, says we like sustainability, right? Come on. Like, but who nowadays, if you gave them a questionnaire, would say, I don't like sustainability? It's like somebody giving you a questionnaire and saying, Teresa, Esther, are you a good daughter? You would always say yes. Right. So so the issue here is the important thing here is not what percentage says it, but the fact that year on year, the number is going up. The, the results I'm showing you here come from Booking.com, Expedia, Google, uh, every single organization is doing that. But let's just take a step back. There are some bad news. And we have to be honest, everybody in this room, all of us, we are hypocrites. OK, starting with me. And uh, people that write about moral disengagement tell us we're hypocrites in a variety of ways. We morally justify that we need to fly to do our job, in my case, ironically, to tell other people how to be sustainable. So I'm doing something unsustainable to tell other people how to be sustainable. I mean, is that silly? You know, we sanitize language. Oh, I'm just popping over to Amsterdam for the weekend, right? Because we don't want it to sound bad. We compare ourselves. You know, we, we go to a conference and we see somebody who came from further away. So we feel okay. We displace responsibility. We say, well, it's not my fault I'm flying. You know, Europark made me, you know, the conference organizers made me. Why did they put the conference in the Azores or, you know, in, in the north of Norway? They could have put it somewhere more convenient and so on and so forth. The issue here is every single one of us says, in principle, I wake up every day wanting to be sustainable. In practice, there are things that just don't allow me to do it, either because the context doesn't allow it or because sometimes it's much more fun to not be sustainable and to just enjoy yourself a little bit more. We assume that people start at the top left quadrant. We assume that the reason why people are not sustainable is because they're unaware that what they're doing is unsustainable. They don't realize that what they're eating is unsustainable, that the activities they choose to do are unsustainable, that the way in which they travel is unsustainable. However, if we start with that premise, we tend to then say, ah, we're going to use the root A, B. I'll first make people feel aware that their behavior is unsustainable, step A. And after I've almost made them feel guilty about that, then people will naturally take step B when I offer them sustainable products. If this was going to work, nobody would smoke. There would be no teenage pregnancies. There would be no violence. There would be no drinking alcohol and driving and so on. Right? So it can work, but not, not really. There are many other things that we can do. So I'm proposing the fol we follow route C, D. I need to find a way in which every single one of your protected areas and ecotourism projects will first find benefits for the customer. So the customer wants to buy the sustainable product, not because it's sustainable, but because it's better quality, it's more convenient, it's lower price, it's easier to buy. It's the normal thing to do in that place, and so on. So that would be step C. And after they buy the sustainable product for reasons other than sustainability, and I'm really explicit with this, and Teresa, this kind of follows on from what we talked about a few months ago. Then we move on to step D. Afterwards, and not before, you make them aware that the thing they just did, that was really cool. That was really sustainable. And then we play on that sense of personal identity. Typical example of this, I cycle to work. Part of my cycling to work is because it's free. Part of it is because I lose weight and I can eat more chocolate, which I really like. Part of it is because I don't have to wait for the bus and share germs with other people. And part of it is because it's sustainable. But frankly, the sustainable thing probably comes forth. The fact that I don't catch germs or I can eat more chocolate in the immediate term to me is more important. We did research a few years ago with tourism businesses based in national parks in the UK. And we saw that 70%, 70 percent, seven zero of the sustainability activities that we knew for sure we had audited, we knew they were definitely doing them, 
those businesses chose to not communicate them to customers. And when we interviewed them said, we feel that communicating sustainability makes us sound worthy and less competent. Remember many years ago when you bought fair trade bananas and essentially you were buying very, very expensive compost because by the time they got home, they were moldy. You couldn't eat many of them. You had to eat them straight away. Very often, the sustainable product has had a lower performance than the unsustainable product. Going to people and telling them, use the bus in my national park because it's the green thing to do, will not work. It will only work if you can say to them, you'll have better views, you'll be able to drink a pint in the pub afterwards, you'll be able to start the walk at one point and finish another, another one. And a, you know, a linear route is more interesting than a circular route, whatever else you're going to find. But the buy it because it's a sustainable message very, very rarely works. It worked, for example, with blue flag beaches. But why? Blue flag beaches were success, and we call it an environmental success. But actually, blue flag beaches is a health and safety success. Nobody wanted to swim in polluted beaches. Right. So we need to think of the same from a sustainability point of view that we bring back home the personal benefit. Now, it is fair that many, many companies are greenwashing. OK, green hushing does happen, particularly your businesses in protected areas. I would say they're more likely to green hush. But when I looked at some of the big hotels and probably the bigger, the more problematic, there is a gap between what the head office says those businesses will do and what we actually found in practice when we visited the hotels. In this case, we visited them in the Mediterranean, in Thailand, and in Mexico. And God, I, if I had two hours and you weren't recording, I could tell you a lot of horror stories, but we're not going to go through that today. Now, you may think, ah, but the public sector is better. Uh -uh. The public sector is far, far worse than the private sector. OK, when we analyzed 101 national tourism strategies, remember, national strategy is a long document, OK, 100, 200 pages, all 100 percent of them mentioned important sustainability, typically in the executive report. However, only 55 percent of them dedicated more than two paragraphs in the entire report to talk about sustainability. And only 2% of them had key performance indicators and policy instruments that would show how we're going to measure this. How did we go from 100% saying it's important to 2% choosing how to measure it? So we have a big problem. Every one of those national parks is saying we want to have more sustainable tourists, followed by a sentence that says, and we will attract people from Australia. And you're thinking, are you for real? Do you know the carbon footprint of doing that, you know, based on income per day? So we're going to look at that shortly. Now, it's fair to say this report I'm just talking about is from 2019. And when I talk to people at the GDS movement, for example, they're showing me that the quality of the policies being written by cities, mostly in Europe, elsewhere, on uh, sustainability marketing is much, much better since 2001 than it was pre 19, uh, 2019. So there is hope. Okay, more organizations are getting on board with these things. So this is the introduction. Let me just now go into some particular benefits that we can have. First benefit, you can use your current sustainability practices if you communicate them well to engage with your customers. So very often you do something sustainable and you find your customers are not contributing to that. You need to ask nicely to start with. Can you see on the bottom left-hand side, there is a cup. This particular beach cafe decided that instead of spending money collecting cups from the beach after the end of the day, and they were the only uh, cafe in that particular beach, so it was very clear it was their rubbish. Instead, they decided to spend money printing something on those cups, which will cost you more money. And the message says, drink in the view. Stunning, isn't it? We aim to keep it that way. And then in small, you can't read it, but I'll tell you what it says. It says, we use natural toxic, uh, free, uh, toxic free detergents and cleaning materials preventing the damage to the beach, the sea, or any wildlife. And if you turn the cup round on the back, it says, and all you have to do is put me in the bin. Essentially, the lesson for you to remember is you need to demonstrate to your customers, I have done 95% of the work. You just need to do the final 
That works a lot better than putting all the responsibility on the customer. You need to give messages that are trustworthy. And obviously using equal labels as a way of backing it up or being members of Europark and so on helps, but we can go much further. You should never say, I am a sustainable business. It's a little bit like Julia Roberts going on television and saying, I'm really beautiful. I, she might be really beautiful, but I'll stop liking it if she says it. Brad Pitt can say Julia Roberts is beautiful, no problem, but she can't say it herself. So look at the top example here on the top right-hand side. Lossman's Fish and Grill meet our great British suppliers. And you've got photos of these suppliers, and there is some storytelling about why my suppliers are great. Now, psychologist tells us that you can say great things about your suppliers, and then this is credible by customers, but also sends a really good message about yourself. But you're not saying, I am great. You're just saying, I am using great suppliers. You need to be honest. Please stop putting messages on your property that says, reuse our towels and you'll save planet Earth. We all know it's going to take a bit more than that. OK, but actually help the customers take decisions. Can you see the man here in the middle, you know, with his uh, device on top called Aguardio? We have installed these devices now in accommodation businesses. And um, the moment you turn your shower on, that device starts to count the number of seconds you've spent in the shower. And we found that by putting these in showers, it reduces the length of people's showers. Now, in hotels, you could use this. But actually, you know who's really using this? Campsites. Particularly because in campsites, you tend to have a problem with queues outside the shower cubicles because you've got a lot of tents and not so many showers. So we've used this as a way of reducing the length of time that people spend in the shower. And you can see the sign at the bottom, an example of being humorous. No smoking. It makes your breath smell and your teeth go horrid, as well as being a danger to the people who live in our forest. Now, I know one of the people in the call today comes from Norfolk, so you probably re recognize this from Bewilderwood, you know, a fantastic children's tourist attraction in Norfolk. This works so much better than having a sign that says fine 200 pounds for being caught smoking here, because now on the back of this sign, your children are the smoking police, because your children will remember the message and will say, eh, are your teeth yellow and horrid? Does your breath smell? Anybody who's a parent or grandparent or uncle or auntie knows how children are the best police. Now, attracting new customers, I've put it here, but frankly, this is the single most difficult thing to do. Attracting first-time customers based on your sustainability messages. My point is, don't do it. Let's first do all the other benefits, and then we'll come back to this afterwards. There are attempts of doing this. You can see here on the screenshot you've got flight searches between London airports and Alicante in Spain. And you can see on Google Flights, that is, but Skyscanner does the same, and others will start doing it also. You can see different times of day, the duration, whether there's a stop or not, the price, and then importantly, the carbon emissions and whether that's above or below the average. And you can see that actually there's very little difference sometimes in the price, but for the same duration and pretty much the same locations, you could go for a lower carbon footprint. And we are seeing more and more business travel agents in particular using this information to say, since you have to fly there for that meeting that you cannot avoid, we will choose the flight with the lowest possible carbon emission for that particular route. We could go further into this. I can come back to it. But there are more, more interesting things that we can talk about that are much more relevant to a small rural tourism business. For example, how can you communicate better to improve customer satisfaction? And the key here is think customer benefits. What's in it for me? How will you make me feel that my holiday in your national park, in your rural area, is generally going to be as good as possible? Can you see the, the, the sign at the bottom? You know, there's the photo of this lovely lady. And on the right hand side, there's part of the text that goes side by side with it. This is part of a booklet I found in a hotel at their breakfast table. The front page says, and who made my breakfast today? The S word didn't appear anywhere. And thank goodness for that. You open it and you always have on the left hand side a photo of an amazing person. Wouldn't you love to get to know this lady? And then on the right hand side, there's a bit of storytelling of which is the product that she supplies to this particular hotel. The hotel that this came from found that the TripAdvisor ratings went up as a result of communicating this. And in the comments on TripAdvisor, people were 
really happy about the breakfast. Now, they had not changed their suppliers. They had simply talked about the suppliers in a much more creative way. You can make customers feel good about some of the things that you do, but you need to think of what's in it for them. Do you see the industrial composter on the top right-hand side? That hotel was putting on their website information of how proud they were that now 12 tons of, comp in, of landfill that would have otherwise, or waste from the kitchen that would have gone to landfill, now were being treated in their garden. And suddenly the message sounds like the garden of this hotel is going to be a wasteland. We change the message. And now the message says, our customers really like the, you know, the flowers and the plants in our garden. The secret for their beauty, the 12 tons of compost that we use. Now, start the message by talking about beautiful flowers, finish it with compost, and you don't need to talk about how the compost was made. The people that know where compost comes from, they will appreciate it. The people that don't know where the compost comes from, they can wait and find out when they get to the hotel. You do not need to tell them about landfill on your website. Nobody's going to choose your hotel because we've reduced landfill waste. Similar with the example of this lovely sheep that you've got here in the middle that looks like he's teasing you a little bit with his tongue out. This hotel basically, you know, changed their message, or I changed their message for them about insulating the roof of the hotel. You know, I'd, I'd previously just said we insulated the roof of the hotel to keep you warmer. And it's like, yeah, okay. But when I found out that what they insulated with was sheep wool and it was their own sheep from their property, I changed the message. And now it says our 300 sheep gave up their winter woolly coat to keep you warm at night, sleep tight. And you may say, well, the message is not finished. You're not said everything you're supposed to do. Well, that's fine. But you communicate those messages and you also put them in places where the reception is of your hotel, for example, will be able to tell the rest of the story. Think again of the majority of really good TripAdvisor and Booking.com customer satisfaction ratings. It's never because your property is really luxurious. It's always because I talk to somebody and they make me feel like a human being. They make me feel like I was welcomed in this place. They talk to me. So much of your sustainability communication can be used to tease customers, to start conversations. So then you can continue that conversation with the waiter, with the receptionist, with the owner of the property, whatever, you know, uh, the, the kind of organization it is that you are. I absolutely love the example of the 50 things to do before you're 11 three quarters. I know some of you come from the UK and you'll be very familiar with this. But the point here is, how do we increase length of stay? How do we increase expenditure? In most of your destinations, we have two types of customers, I would say. The customers that come once and they say, I've seen the Norfolk Broads. I have seen the Norwegian Arctic. I have seen the Azore Islands. And they, they, the destination bagging, okay? And then you've got customers that come back time and time again. And we all know that the cost of marketing to repeat customers is much lower than the cost of marketing to first-time buyers. So things like the 50 things to do before you're 11 and three quarters are great campaigns to get people to spend more time in nature. In this case, for parents to talk to children, right? It's really sad, I find, when you go places and everybody's looking at their phone and nobody talks to one another. But also, if you look at the list of activities to do, all of them are free and all of them have a zero carbon footprint. Now, if I had said, when you come to the Norfolk Broads, do things that have zero carbon footprint, people would end up thinking, what are you going on about? Whereas if you tell me, hey, cost of living crisis, 50 things to do for free or 50 things to do when you're still young. Look at the list here. You can climb a tree, you can roll down a really big hill, you can camp out in the wild. When you've done 10 of these and you are at the National Trust property, you get the most important thing in the world for a six-year-old, a sticker. A sticker that says, I'm an adventurer, I'm a discoverer, right? All of which basically encourages those kids to say to the parents, next weekend, can we go out in nature again? I'd like to get the next sticker. And suddenly you've had five weekends in nature, each weekend doing five more things, and the parents have engaged with those kids, and they actually be behave like a family again. And the cost, zero. The reason I'm saying cost zero is important to me is many of your customers will come to your destination, will stay more nights at your destination if there are more things to do that don't cost money.
And we all know that the majority of what they'll spend money on is accommodation, food, and transport. People tend to not want to spend very much on activities. And if the activities you're promoting are very expensive, their willingness to stay there for longer or to repeat the destination is going to go down. I'll give you one more example here. Can you see the beautiful puffin on the bottom left-hand side? These birds, to me, are just amazing, right? In um, an RSPV reserve, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds Reserve, this is near my home where I live in Yorkshire, um, during the months when the birds give birth to their babies, if you go to one of the cafes nearby the um, RSPV reserve, they don't sell you cappuccino, they sell you capuffin chino. Why a capuffin chino? The chocolate sprinkles on your cappuccino are in the shape of a puffin. Right now, I know that Starbucks invented this a long time ago with their kind of Christmas decorations on their chocolates. So why can't we learn from Starbucks and we can do the same thing? Trust me, if a cappuccino arrives at your table as a customer and he's got a bird on it, you are likely to ask the waiter or waitress, hey, why is there a bird on my coffee? And the explanation that will come with it is so much more powerful than somebody giving you a leaflet that says, let's go and see that. Right? And also, when do customers take decisions of what to do when they stop for a coffee? You know, like they've done something in the morning, they'll stop for a coffee, and that couple will look at each other and say, what shall we do this afternoon? And then suddenly, this capo finchino arrives at your table, and you're like, da-da, I know what I'm doing this afternoon, right? So the reason why I'm saying this is you need to find ways of making your customers feel special, and you need to give them things to do. Nudge them toward the activities you want them to do, and find more creative ways of communicating. Let me give you one more example here. We're looking at how we can get people to stay for longer, to recommend, to repeat visitation. Some of these relates to seasonality, but not necessarily. But the example at the top left-hand side, you can see that uh, little jar with, with wooden coins. This particular hotel, I gave them the advice and they took it on and they said it worked really well. They're based in the Pyrenees in Catalonia. I know that one of you comes from the Pyrenees. So this is from Sardinia Resort. Uh, David, you know, the owner of the property there is very, very creative. You give him half an idea and they turn it into three. Okay. So what Sardinia Resort did was I said to them, look, when customers arrive, they need to feel like they are the protagonists. You need to empower them. So rather than saying, for example, we'll give money to charity, if they arrive using public transport, when they arrive, you can say, well done for using public transport. Here's a coin and here are three different urns. You decide to which one of those three different charities we're going to give money to, our charitable donations. And one at the moment could be the Turkey and Syria appeal, and the other one could be CO2F setting, and the third one could be money for a local church where they need to do some reparations. But the fact that you let the customer decide where the money is going to go is so much more powerful. And what we found is that anything else you ask the customer to do they systemically related during that stay, they're much, much more likely to do it because you will give them another wooden coin and they will decide again who is going to get some charitable money on the back of it, right? You need to weatherproof your offer. You need to add a calendar. We can talk about this for another day. There's plenty to be said. You need to make customers more aware of your work. I'm going to finish this section with this final example. I think Teresa, I did use the example of the flowers last time, didn't I? about, so I'm going to move on and not use this example of flowers, but if I didn't use it, then we can come back to this. Because I've seen that you've got a few people registered for today that come from destinations. And although the title initially was, what can we do for businesses? I want to have a few ideas around destinations. So first thing for destinations, guys, we need every single one of your accommodation businesses to be sustainability certified. End of. Okay. Why? Because the carbon footprint of a certified business compared to a non-certified one is typically 15 to 20% lower. And if we have to decarbonize by 55% by 2030, following the EU Fit for 55 strategy, the easiest way to do that is to work with every single one of your businesses and make sure that they reduce the carbon footprint. Because at least this way, you can keep the same number of tourists, but you can still reduce the carbon footprint. Because the alternative is going to be reduce the number of tourists, right? So find a way that your customers still spend as much as possible money with the lowest possible carbon footprint. 
And so certifying business is one way of doing that. Now, you may say we're finding this really, really difficult. Yeah, true. But I'll also say we could try harder. So last week I was speaking with um, the city of Belfast, and they said to me they're going from 5% of their batch stock certified as sustainable to more than 80% in three years. I have never seen a destination make such a, a transformation in such a short period of time. Copenhagen, the example you've got here, is already at more than 70%. Gothenburg is at 85% and so on. We need much more um, when we organize, for example, events from our public sector using vegetarian diet as normal because it's got a, a much lower carbon footprint. We need to make sure that we source more locally. We're sourcing locally is not enough. You're reducing the carbon footprint from transport. But guys, beef is still beef. It still has a massive carbon footprint. Okay, If you can serve wild boar because it's a pest in certain parts of the country, then why not serve wild boar? You've, you've helped reduce a problem and it doesn't have the same carbon footprint. But one of the indicators you need in your strategy as a destination is what is the percentage of tourism services that certify the sustainable. Now, second element here to consider destination um, uh, you know, level. When you as a destination choose to market to some target markets and not others, you are deciding what is going to be the carbon footprint of your destination. And you and only you are personally responsible for that carbon footprint. The graph here is from Barcelona. Okay, And you can see on the vertical, basically tells you what is the expenditure per person for the entire trip to Barcelona. Many of these are weekend breaks. Okay, So you can see that our markets, this is from 2019, by the way, that's why Russia is still there. But Russian market was spending the most per person per trip from the data we had at the moment. We, we knew that the um, Arab market, for example, was spending more, but we didn't have the data. But if So if we had taken decisions on which markets to attract just on expenditure, who would we go for? Russia, USA, Japan. We don't have data from China here, but I imagine we would have attracted them as well. However, the moment you put in a graph and you say, okay, we now have carbon and we have expenditure. Boy, the graph looks very different, doesn't it? Because suddenly the Japanese market or the Canadian market don't look so attractive anymore, do they? You need to consider what is the carbon footprint per euro or how many euros will you get for every ton of carbon footprint for any single market? We have to find, we, we cannot just calculate tourism based on benefits, how much money we're going to make, and not consider the costs. So reduce the average distance by your tourists, market your tourists that are more local to you, increase the length of stay, because the main problem here is transport, increase their expenditure, so at least if they're going to have a higher carbon footprint, they can spend more, optimize the methods of transport, so market to you know, to markets where there's a direct flight as opposed to there is a connecting flight. Because we have a lot of work to do on carbon reduction. Third element, and we're nearly there, and then we've got time for questions. Normalize the behavior of tourists. Every single one of your destinations needs to collect data on whether your residents are happy with tourism. And not only tourism in general, but what types of tourism do they want to encourage and what types of tourism they want to discourage. Okay. Now, I am not proposing that you do a survey where you say, we don't want tourists from this nationality, but we want tourists from this other nationality, because that's racist. What I'm proposing is that you ask customers or your residents, what type of activities do you want to promote? Do you want more people coming for weekend breaks? Do you want people to come cycling and walking? Do you want people to come for you know, site? You know, what, what, what kind of activities do you want them to do? What, what, and what kind of things do you feel like these are already overdone. And I have never understood why we put so much effort into marketing for first-time visitors and not repeat visitors. There's a reason why, although we talk about national parks, I've given you a photo of Paris, because I think it's something we can all relate to. If you went to Paris for the first time in your life, would you go to the Eiffel Tower, yes or no? 100% yes. If you were going to Paris for the sixth time, would you still go to the Eiffel Tower? No. You would look at it from afar, but you wouldn't go up it anymore. If you went to Paris for two days or for 10 days as a holiday, how many times would you go up the Eiffel Tower? Still only once. 
Okay. The reason I'm saying this is why do we keep targeting weekend breaks for first time visitors? Why, have, why, why haven't we stopped marketing that? Why don't we? Because those kind of tourists will go and create honeypot locations where you've got maximum concentration of visitors. And then there's locals disliking that type of tourism. We need to change it and we need to find forms of tourism that allow for um, new products to be purchased in new locations. And, you know, let, let's think of tourism a little bit like rain, okay? Regular, constant rain, the ground can absorb it. A flood of rain in one location does damage, okay? So the problem isn't whether it rains or it doesn't rain. The problem isn't whether you've got tourism or you don't have tourism. The problem is the capacity of your locations to absorb that tourism into its current fabric. Last example, and as a reminder of what Teresa said earlier on, a few months ago, I gave a talk specifically looking at how to reduce seasonality. Something I want you to go back to if you haven't done it yet, look at the website, tourismexperience.org, look at the materials that we've got in there, and then follow through the link that Teresa and Esther will share, probably in the chat if you haven't done it some other way, so you can go and watch the previous presentation that I already gave about three months ago. Thank you very much. Um, the presentation today has been sponsored by the EU Life Project Experience. I have to always acknowledge my sponsors, of course. You know, and I sound like a YouTuber now, don't I? And um, but and now we're opening uh, up to you for any questions and answers. Thank you so much, uh, Xavier. <laughs> As always, very uh, interesting, uh, thankful uh, prompter. I don't know how to say this. Have, I already have several several questions. I will start and then I will let the yep. flow to other people. So, but because um, so when you are talking about sustainability, I have the feeling that we are only referring to this as almost everyone eh, to sustainability in the sense of ecological sustainability. But sustainability, at least in the origin, when, when the first uh, word was um, was used, it was sustainability also including economic and social. Sure. So you were saying, no, the, the bicycle, the bicycle, one reason is it's free. For me, this is sure. economical and sustainability. Right. Oh, healthy. Yes, it's social. So yeah. it's like um, you are putting all the acid in the environmental. I can understand because I think this is all the feeling that everyone associates their sustainability with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also... I use more examples that environmental because many of us tend to be more familiar with that and we need a place to start, right? But we could go further. You know, we've done this now in half an hour. This is normally a four-hour face-to-face course where we make it much more interactive, you know, so we could go much more, much more in depth. But, but, but the issue there, the, the example you're giving, Teresa, we, we could apply this to many more situations. Absolutely. And, and, and also, we don't have to look at it as just a way of reducing negative impacts of tourism you know somebody was just asking now you know on the chat for me to elaborate a little bit more on what i mean by invisible tourists mm -hmm. you know like look if you have a lot of tourists that come you know to a to a destination and they come in mass it's very difficult to absorb them they, they're too visible they look too different they behave too different to what the local people will do so then we need to create businesses that are specifically dedicated for tourists a business that can only cater for tourists will definitely suffer from seasonality because tourists aren't there all year round. To me, an invisible tourist is the one that will behave like a local, will buy products like a local, will eat in the same places like a local, mm -hmm. will make an effort to learn something about the language, will appreciate mm -hmm. the place they go into, like, uh, and, and will choose to come to your place specifically because they're interested in what they have to do in that particular place. Okay. I have two more questions. Go for it. Uh, so uh, for me, it's like, um, I don't know if I'm going to express my, my, well myself, like a bit ironic. Of course, we all want to reduce the carbon uh, footprint, but this redu um, redu uh, reduction will affect all the global world, whereas uh, the expenditure that tourists do is, is in a single place. So why, so why, <laughs> you know, you're not, you see my point? Yep. And, and then, of course, we come from the protected area sector. We all agree that we really need to reduce the carbon footprint. But other sectors, why? Why would do this if the benefit of reducing carbon footprint is going benefit again to apply for all the world? Why? Why? And then again to reduce it. Well, I mean, look, our, our governments across Europe yeah. have committed 
that every single one of our countries is going to reduce carbon footprint across sectors by 55% by 2030. How many of our national governments, and then this is now being implemented into legislation, and all of the funding you'll be able to apply for from an EU point of view is going okay. to have a very, very strong decarbonization element built into it. Okay, but but I agree, we tend to be a little bit hypocritical with these things, mm. right? So it's a little bit like eating a nice salad at lunchtime, so then I can have a big, you know, slap up meal in the evening. You know, if I only look at what happened at lunchtime, I sound great. But then, you know, you look at the full picture and it doesn't so much. It's not it's not going to happen. I mean, some of it has to be legislation driven. Some of mm -hmm. it will have to be driven by incentives. We know that corporations that you know actually business travel is going to decarbonize much much faster than leisure travel i am aware that many of your destinations people rely on cars to come to your destination but actually the major problem with increased carbon footprint from tourism is city tourism city breaks because city breaks people rely on flying for those city breaks in rural tourism my guess is that your carbon footprint per person per night is not going up massively unless you've got very specific campaigns to attract you know people to kind of a i don't know santa's lapland you know sort of tourism mm -hmm. okay but for most protected areas i'm guessing that is not going up massively in that sense but some of it is going to have to be legislation driven i i doubt that many national parks will say okay i'm going to take a hit on my income generation because I want to be more sustainable. That's why we need to look at the three things together. We need to, you know, and, and when I was speaking with Barcelona, for example, was saying, right, so if the German market is already spending quite a lot, how do I get the German market to spend a little bit more? And this way we can stop marketing to this really far away market because our decisions will have to be revenue neutral. We, you know, we'll have to reduce our carbon while increasing our revenue or at least not losing revenue. I'm not proposing that anybody reduces their revenue, not as their first option anyway. Okay, clear. When, uh, when, when you were uh, putting the, um, this flight from England to, to Alicante, the difference, the difference in carbon, where does it come from? Because if the distance is the same, the food is the same? Do um, you know? two, two elements. One is the airplanes are newer or older. The other one is whether oh. the airline is already experimenting with hydrogen and sustainable aviation fuel. But typically, the most important is load factors. How full is the airplane? How full is it? Okay. Yeah. But also, we know that connecting flights with stopovers tend to have a much higher carbon mm -hmm. footprint than direct flights. I'm going to go to the chat now. Uh, some There's a question from the Kencoms in how to, would you encourage people to volunteer? In, in the destination as a way of, uh, of increasing the, the experience for, for visitors. You can only do it if you make them feel proud of what they're doing. So play on social identity. You need to give them a reward that they can go back home and they can brag. So pe people will do these things if it makes them feel like, wow, look, I am a great person. It becomes part of my image. Or if they can brag to others about it. So it's about creating sense of pride. Thank you. There's a question about if you could elaborate a little bit more about invisible tourists. I, I did that a few minutes yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Um, well, they're asking for a recommendation of a specific uh, certificate on accommodation business. It, it will depend. But the first most obvious thing to do is go to booking.com because it's free. OK, so Booking.com has now collected data from 1.4 million tourism accommodation businesses on your sustainability practices. And the 400,000 that provided the most amount of detail are now being highlighted on their page for free, all of it. And Booking has committed to increase traffic uh, in terms of an amount of bookings to the properties that display some sort of sustainability practices. Once you do that, then move on and start doing some others. Okay. Um, do you know how Belfast uh, promoted this uh, really improvement? In incentives. Economic incentives. And it, in, so basically, in the first year, they paid for the cost of becoming certified. And afterwards, now they're in a situation where the business said, well, now that the majority of business is certified, I cannot be the one that goes back. You know, I don't want to lose the certificate. 
So gaining the certificate was was a barrier, but actually a lot of people will maintain it simply because they're saying it will look bad if I lose my certificate. So they'll stay on for that reason. Uh, another tactical question. Do you know how could um, how could we explain to, to, to the locals that uh, a new uh, bus line is going to be beneficial for all of them because they can to reduce the number of cars? It, so, it's a very specific example. I don't have an example yeah. to, to follow with that, but um, I mean, obviously, providing public transport for the local community can only be a good thing. I, I would doubt that anybody in the local community would see that as being negative. Um, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, isn't the typical complaint in um, rural areas that there's not enough public transport available and rather than the opposite? Beth, do you want to, to complement this discussion? comes from Beth Cobo from La Garrocha. Yeah, oh, thanks so much. Um, well, the question is because they think it's only for tourists. That's the problem. Ah, okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I then and I understand that makes more sense. Um, I would need to look at it in particular. I don't have an example. I can say these are the people did it and it worked well for them. Sometimes if we brand visibly the you know the bus too much as this is a tourist bus, then the locals may end up feeling like it's not for them. I can I can see where you're coming from with that. I don't know. I mean, obviously, it will depend on so many things. What is the cost of that bus as opposed to other buses or other forms of transport? Um, in rural areas, local people are very tempted to just use their car. It's so much more convenient. Now, now I have a, a important comment from, from Mara from the Romania, from Wi Fan. So yeah. you, she, she, uh, you said at some point that beef is beef, is beef and then that yeah. um, many of the yeah, accommodation and restoration should, should uh, promote more vegetarian food. But on the other hand, of course, uh, you know, many landscapes are maintained by livestock. Uh, yeah. So, and if we reduce this uh, livestock, this will have consequences in, in, in these landscapes. Yeah. Um, uh, so what is your opinion? So tough. And tough. Yeah. Uh, the world is changing. We can pretend it's not going to change. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I, I mean, frankly, what I would prefer is that the battery chickens and all the animals that have been grown in poor conditions are the ones that we stop producing and that we keep producing only food that is in good conditions. But ultimately, we need to reduce all production of meat. Okay. Um... More questions? We've got a question from Gemma saying, what percentage of people decide to travel in a sustainable way? Okay. Honestly, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, today I will travel in a sustainable way. People wake up and say, what is the most convenient, easiest, most cost-effective way for me to go from A to B? And if it happens to be the sustainable way, you know, great. But this is what I was saying earlier on. Go back to think, how can I make my sustainable option the cheapest, the most convenient, the most practical? And then they will choose it for those reasons, not because it's sustainable. Uh, another question that uh, we have overlooked is, uh, if you know of any country example that works with the spending versus carbon uh, footprint versus length of stay. Well, so I know that Norway has made some attempts when it comes to this, and but um, it wasn't always very well received by the industry, as you could expect, and we cannot expect the Norwegian airlines is going to change their mind because of this, okay? Um, but, but as far as I can see, it's one of the only countries I'm aware has been doing this. Over the next couple of months, I'll be working with Nextdoor, and I know some of the Europark members also are in regions that are Nextdoor uh, regions, to see how we can promote more of these practices amongst their members. I would be very happy also to talk about this with some of your Europark members. The first thing to do is to measure this. And if you want an Excel tool where you can enter some of your own data to do this, um, I gave my details at the beginning of the talk, and you'll be able to see my LinkedIn and my you know, Twitter you know, handles there. So we can provide to you some of the material. So where you can at least figure out what is currently the carbon footprint for different markets 
they're coming to your destination. More questions <laughs> arriving. Um, Guillermo Chaminade from, from Soterasen National Park in Sweden. He's saying that, uh, that he, as a visitor, um, as, as a protected area, they, they want specifically to have more visitors, but the yep. visitors that come on public transport produce less rubbish. Um, she said that he finds very interesting that what you said about not putting all the pressure, all the decision on, 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 on the visitors. So about, for example, take out your um, and take out the rubbish bins. It does the visitors to, to take the rubbish home for sustainability. Is this a wrong measure? You are asking them for an effort. And so, Guillermo, it's a very specific question. I think also we will need then, then to look at uh, on a case by case basis. You may also find that you, you have particular locations where you say when there is a particular problem in that location, we need to do it differently. You know, my, my starting point for today was you are in national parks where typically they could benefit from more income generation and more job creation. We don't necessarily want to reduce the volume of tourism and we want to spread that tourism. But it's true that in even in any single one national park, there will be points that are where there is too much pressure and we need to work on landscaping the location and visitor management facilities to try to reduce that pressure. So we need to come back and look specifically at the situation we're speaking about. But but there will be locations where you'll have no choice and we'll have to create that sort of change. Yeah, but also, also he's he's asking what would you think? You, you were asking that uh, the responsibility should be shared between, no. in this case, the protected area and the visitor in, 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 in behaving uh, properly, no? sustainably. Sure. Uh, but, many parks are yeah many parks are taking out the dustbins so yeah, uh, because yeah. so then it is it is on the visitor responsibility too well but this is true but then you need to change the messaging as well so for example i remember a park that had a plastic two kilometers into the walk and at a particular be beautiful viewpoint they had a plastic bench and on yes. the back of the bench it had a sign that said you are amazing you know, the first 5,000 plastic bottles you have recycled have allowed us to make this plastic bench so you can enjoy the view, you know? So enjoy your picnic. Yeah. And so the message essentially was, you're telling the customer you're amazing and they're doing something really good. If you tell the customer you're a bad person because you're likely to leave rubbish, you know, remember, we're all like children. You, you can't give them a negative uh, message, right? It's not necessarily going to work. Particularly in a location where you say you don't have the number of forest wardens to, to police the behavior of visitors. So then you need to use different ways of trying to nudge their behavior. Also, if you arrive to a very, very nice place and you see your dustbin there, this place yeah. is not so nice, not yeah. nice anymore. But, so, but, but Guillermo, yeah. this will depend. I can see yeah. why in certain locations you say well, there's such volume of visitors that we just have no choice. Luis Bruguera was asking about any reliable car for, car, you know, footprint calculators. There are many, and I suppose that is the problem, isn't it? We've all seen that, and and you'll calculate it with different, you know, calculators and the the cost, you know, that you'll have to pay or the carbon footprint. They'll say that you're responsible for varies a lot. So I can see how you end up then being confused and saying which one is it that we should do. Probably the one that is most expensive but also most reliable is atmosphere. Okay, so I can type it here for you. But many of you will find that atmosphere is outside the price range of what visitors to your area can pay for if they wanted to carbon offset uh, any of their carbon emissions. There's a difference as well between you using data of some of these uh, carbon calculators to at least understand the current carbon footprint of your customers and based on their current behavior and then you could use it almost like personas where you can enter new data. You can say, well, if my customer behaved in this other way, what would their carbon footprint be? So you can then get potential different carbon footprints for different type of persona behaviors. And then saying, oh, every time we attract more of this type of tourists, the carbon footprint associated with it is this. But if we attracted this kind of carbon footprint, uh, this kind of customer with this other behavior, the carbon footprint would be this other, which would be lower. 
We're going to have to leave it here, guys, because it is 5-2, and um, it's been a real pleasure. Hopefully, you got something out of it. I think the fact there's still 76 of you until the end of the talk um, says that many of you found it useful. I look forward to meeting some of you in person at one of the Europark events, uh, if not at another event like this online at some point in the future.